Good evening, everyone. Welcome, I'm David Scobie, Dean of the New School for Public Engagement here at the New School. And I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's panel on progressives in the election of 2012, co-sponsored with The Nation magazine. Uh, as our divisional name, public engagement underscores, the New School is committed to education in public, for and with the engaged public, on matters of public import. Public programs like tonight's have been part of our DNA since our founding in 1919, and our partnership with the nation continues this tradition. In the past three years, we've welcomed our friends from the nation uh, for forums on 9-11, Occupy Wall Street, and other topics. We see them as our civic collaborators in a democracy project where progressive educators, progressive journalists, and public intellectuals all play a crucial role. Special thanks to Katrina Vanden Heuvel, the publisher and editor-in-chief of The Nation, as well as her colleagues for this partnership. We value it greatly. Nothing could be a more important issue, of course, than the 2012 election. We're in the thick of it, and as you probably are, and you are all probably processing last night's debate and thinking about its effects on the campaign. I'm delighted, though, that we have an occasion tonight to help us step back from the tactics and microdynamics of the race and help us make a larger sense of the role of progressives in and after the election and also the stakes of this political moment for progressive politics and policy making. To help us with that, we have a great group of journalists, intellectuals, and political activists Katrina Vanden Heuvel, editor and publisher of The Nation, John Nichols, the magazine's Washington correspondent, Chris Hayes, the host of MSNBC's Up Close with Chris Hayes, political strategist Elise Hogue, and Patricia Williams, professor of law at Columbia University. Richard Kim, the executive editor of The Nation, will moderate the discussion. After our panel discussion, there will be plenty of time for questions and response, and we will have uh, interns prowling up and down the aisles with cards and pencils to take your written questions. The panel's also being broadcast on free speech TV and live stream. Welcome to our television and our online viewers. And live stream guests can log on and pose their own questions to the panel. Finally, let me take a moment to give a warm thank you to Peter Rothberg, Managing Editor of The Nation, and our stalwart partner in these New School Nation events, and also to my colleague Pam Tillis, who always does an amazing job of making our public programming so vibrant. And now, Richard Kim. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming out here tonight. Um, I think uh, David introduced these fine panelists, so we don't need to do that. Um, and we'll get right into it. Um, there are index cards that you should have um, to collect questions, and that'll happen in, a, in, in about an hour or so. Um, so let me just give you a little snapshot of where things stand. Um, there are 19 days left until the election. The latest poll show Barack Obama and Mitt Romney in a dead heat. The last time I hit refresh on the Talking Points Memos poll tracker, which Katrina knows I do have about <laughs> once every 16 and a half minutes, um, it had Romney up by 1.1 percentage points. The Democrats have a pretty decent shot of holding on to the Senate. Chris Murphy in Connecticut, Bill Nelson in Florida, Elizabeth Warren, Tim Kaine in uh, Virginia, Claire McCaskill in Missouri, Tammy Baldwin in Wisconsin have all opened up a small lead against their Republican opponents. Um, Heidi Heitkamp in North Dakota and Richard Carmona in Arizona are in striking distance. The Democrats' prospects for grabbing the House, however, are looking a little dismal. Um, Republicans are expected to win about 226 seats. Um, and even if they lose all the toss-up states, they'll hold on to their majority. Um, and this should tell you a little bit about what Obama will face if he wins re-election in November um, at the start of the next legislative session. It's likely that when all is said and done, about $6 billion 
will have been spent on the 2012 election overall, making this the most expensive election in U.S. history. About $2.5 billion of that will have been spent on the presidential race alone. And the big factor, of course, in all this is the post-Citizens United campaign finance rules, which allow outside spending to soar um, in far greater proportion than we saw in the past. And the vast majority of that has been from the wealthiest 1% of Americans. Um, and even if you only count publicly disclosed contributions, Jane Mayer of The New Yorker recently calculated that the top 0.07% of donors, the top 0.07% of donors, are exerting a greater influence over the 2012 election than the bottom 86% combined. The irony here is that most of this money has been spent trying to convince an ever dwindling sliver of the electorate. There are only about eight or nine swing states in play. Um, those are the only states the campaigns are really hitting hard. Um, and in those states, there are only about 7% of likely voters who are still undecided. That is where the $6 billion is more or less being directed. Um, I would be remiss not to mention briefly that the past two years have also seen a concerted attempt by the right to suppress the vote. Um, at least 19 states have passed voter ID laws or laws curtailing early registration. And the good news here, and Ari Berman at The Nation has reported on, on some of this, the courts have blocked at least 11 of these laws, including in, in really crucial states like Pennsylvania and Ohio. That said, a lot of the damage has already been done. In Florida, one in four African Americans will be affected by laws barring ex-felons ex from voting. And because of the new laws on voter registration make it really difficult for registrars to, 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 to register voters legally, um, the League of Women Voters and other groups like that have just given up. They have not registered voters in Florida this year. And the result of that, in 2008, for example, Democrats registered almost 260,000 new voters in Florida. This year, they've registered less than 12,000. So you see the impact of these early registration uh, laws already. There have been three debates so far two between Obama and Romney, and one between Joe Biden and Paul Ryan. There is one more to go on foreign policy scheduled for Monday night in Boca Raton, where we have to remember was the place Mitt Romney uh, made his famous statement that 47% of voters are dependent on government, consider themselves victims, and will never vote for him anyway. I hope on November 6th that 47% is a little bit bigger, um, but the debate is a good place to start with all of this. So Chris, we have watched you watch the debates on TV. Uh, my, my opinion of last night is that the clear winner of, of the debate were the undecided voters of Long Island, um, who, who asked, like, there's a lot of really terrific set of probing questions. Um, you know, what did you think of last night? We certainly saw a different Obama come out. Is it gonna be enough to sort of turn the tables? And, 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 and what did you see watching? I, ag I agree on the questions. Um, I think Mitt Romney's people were probably rethinking the idea of holding a debate in New York State. Um, <laughs> and this, this gets to something that I think is a little tricky. We think about swing voters and we think about independent voters, and the political science research on this is fairly clear, that even of the people that either register as independent or say that they're swing voters, they're actually just loosely attached partisans. And you could tell, I mean, when a young woman gets up and says, I'm, what are you going to do about pay equity in the workplace? I mean, this is not, I'm not saying she lied, that she's, she's actually made up her mind, but she is a loosely attached partisan. I mean, this is someone who is a loosely attached Democrat, and I thought, thought a fair amount of the questions actually came from that general direction. But I thought the questions were great. I thought the question, the best question I thought was about George W. Bush. I thought that was an incredibly mm -hmm. honest question mm -hmm. from that woman who basically said, I'm frustrated, I'm disappointed, but... It seems to me that if I vote for you, we'll be going back to George W. Bush's policies. And the hilariousness, this, this is one moment in the debate that I thought has not gotten enough attention. First, Mitt Romney tried to not answer the question because he wanted to litigate the previous answer. So he was kind of bullying Candy Crowley about the previous answer and how he didn't get a response. And then finally, he says, okay, I'll answer the question. And his first response, you can go look this up in the transcript, how are you different from George W. Bush? And literally, the first response was, well, I am more into drilling for oil than George W. Bush. <laughs> that was actually the response. He, his first response was, number one, there were some technologies that didn't exist under George W. Bush that exist now, and George W. Bush was just constrained in that he, he, he didn't have the full ability to scrape this husk of an earth for every last cell of carbon beneath our surface, but I will. 
this was how he differentiated himself. In terms of um, Obama's performance, I thought, I basically think what everyone thought was that he was more assertive. I thought Romney's bullying was incredibly off-putting. I never know how median voters see this because I'm far from a median voter, but I thought the bullying was just imperious and prickish and um, didn't come off well. And I think the other frustrating conventional wisdom is right, which is that Romney cleared some sort of acceptability threshold in the first debate, mm -hmm. and whatever polling movement we'll see out of this debate will not be as large as the polling movement out of the last debate, because there was a lot more wiggle room in, there was more bounce for Romney to get out of clearing a threshold of acceptability than there is from the president in being assertive as he was in this debate. John, I think you were at Hofstra last night. Am I, am I right about that? And um, I read that Green Party candidate Jill Stein was also there and <laughs> arrested um, for protesting her exclusion um, from, from this debate. Um, so two questions. You know, you've written about the Presidential Debate Commission and third parties and opening up the debate to these candidates. Um, do you think that should have happened last night? And, and just also give us your sense of what the room was like. Um, okay. You know, we weren't there, and so what, what, what did it look like in, the, in, that, in that room? Well, first off, I, I would have been arrested with Jill Stein if I didn't have a nation deadline to meet. <laughs> I'm um, glad you met it. Yeah. This is my editor, Richard, so I had to had to do that. Um, There's no bail money for you, John. I know that's what I you know. Whereas Jill well, had really clear. had okay. legal counsel, and, and the nation just didn't stand behind me. Uh, <laughs> but no, the uh, look. Let's begin with the debates. I I think the debates are absolutely, totally completely, overwhelmingly awful. <laughs> they are indefensibly indefensible. And the reason for that is because they are completely corrupt. There is no corruption deeper than the Commission on Presidential Debates. There are you know, literally totalitarian states which you know, seek to achieve a higher level of fairness than the CPD. And, uh, and the reason for this is that there was a brief period in the 1980s where things kind of got a little bit interesting. You know, John Anderson petitioned his way onto the ballot in 1980 and then forced his way into a debate and then Carter didn't want to debate him and it was, it was kind of getting sort of worth paying attention to. And so, the Democratic and Republican Party chairs. Now, obviously, an ironic moment. How would they ever agree on anything? Because they're, they're different parties. And yet, somehow, they found an area of agreement in that we could get together and create debates that would ultimately make sure that there would always be just a Democratic and Republican Party. And the only way that you could possibly get into the game is if, say, Lyndon Johnson had given you the control over managing Medicare and Medicaid payments in the 60s and you became Ross Perot. And then you could have enough money to buy your way in. But <laughs> anybody who's actually just got a good idea, you can't get in. So the debates are a terrible mess. And the structure of the debates is horrific, and it's getting worse, because we now have debates where, the, the, in addition to talking about what the candidates might have done or might not have done, and, and admittedly, questions last night, fabulous. We found out that you know, like kids from Long Island are actually dramatically more engaged with and on top of the political process than the top journalists in America. <laughs> and, but, the, when, it, when all is said and done, the, the, the structure of the thing is so oriented toward elite media and toward a controlled discussion that at the end of the day you see exactly why in this republic, with all of the energy and everything going around this campaign, we won't get to 55% turnout because we don't give people options. And you know who suffers the most as a result of this? the Democratic and Republican nominees. Because if Jill Stein, the Green Party candidate, or Gary Johnson, the Libertarian Party candidate, had been in those debates at key moments, and you can actually identify them, pay equity with Jill Stein, Gary Johnson talking about, let's talk about drilling, let's really go for it. You know, the bottom line is, you would have forced Romney and Obama to say more. 
And we know this from around the world. We'll close this with this notion. We know from around the world that when you include third, fourth, fifth, sixth party candidates in France, sometimes an eight or nine candidate debate, that at the end of the day, the major parties usually prevail. But there's an interesting thing that happens. The major parties get better. They get more interesting, and their candidates rise to a better level. In France, they just elected a president. Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the candidate of the left party, was never going to be the president of France. But when he took a truck out in front of Standard and Poor's and got on the back of the truck with a bullhorn and said, you lowered our credit rating, you cannot lower the credit rating of a republic. We refuse to honor who you are. We refuse to listen to the bankers and the investors. Then Hollande, the Socialist Party candidate, said, jeepers, I got a guy who's actually exciting people over here. I'd better start talking about taxing trading and taxing uh, investments and things of that nature. And then suddenly, the conservative Sarkozy is in favor of a Robin Hood tax on stock transfers. And so when you bring the alternative parties in, you bubble up a better politics. We are being denied that by the Commission on Presidential Debates. And if I could advocate for anything, I would say, boy, next week, what I desperately want, what I would just love to have, is to have Gary Johnson and Jill Stein in that foreign policy debate talking about empire and what it means when you drop drones on people around the world. Because that would make a hell of a lot better debate. Elise, I want to. Buddy Romer too. I want to ask you, Elise. You, you you've worked for Media Matters as a, as, a, as a senior advisor and at Move On as the communications and political director. You know, I think by my count, Romney lied seven or eight times last night in in really obvious ways and and has in past debates and that's promoted this sort of like cottage industry of fact checking. Like every outlet now has fact checks and then people are fact checking the fact checkers. Um, and, you know, I think that's great. I love putting fact checkers to work. I worry that the actual people are not reading those fact checks, the, the sort of masses of voters. Um, so, you know, are we in this sort of era of post-truth politics and, and, and what do we do about that, you know, <laughs> besides, besides run the fact checks? Um, you know, I, I think we all have to recognize this is not a certainty, it's a strategy. Right, and it's still to be seen if the strategy is going to be successful. I wrote a piece after the first debate that was titled, Lie Quickly, after the time Alan Grayson got up in front of Congress and said the Republican plan for health care was to die quickly. And Romney had lied 27 times in 38 minutes, by I think progresses count, and I trust them. But, um, and you know, what happens when you've got a party whose strategy is just to lie is we create a sense of the president or the democratic surrogates literally following the elephant across the circus tent trying to clean up the shit behind him, you know? <laughs> and that's, you know, because there, there is a sense of fidelity to the truth more on one party than the other, um, you put yourself in a defensive position. Um, the fact checkers are challenged by several different things. One is we live in this incredibly fractured meeting, media environment where you can actually find mostly a fact checker to tell you anything you want <laughs> is true, right? So you, we saw this last night, right? We saw the most amazing yeah. moment in the debate last night was when Romney was actually really sure that Obama had not called what mm -hmm. happened in Benghazi an act of terror. And he just, his face was to me the analogy for this entire election because he had so bought what his own media and his own advisors were telling him mm. that when Candy Crowley did her job, which I thought she did actually almost too even handedly, but she said, you know, you are, no, he did actually, the president did call this an act of terror the second day, but you are right that, you know. Anyway, that moment was the most honest moment in the debate because that was the moment that showed that. It, it turns into a psychosis, right? When you have everything reinforcing the lies that you're telling and that you're being told, it turns into a psychosis. And that's why, you know, when, when progressives 
say to me, I can't even engage in the debate because it's, it's like I'm talking to a crazy person. We are talking to people who have an entirely different set of facts and they're told that all the time. Now, the, the second piece of this is that when you're spending $6 billion in an election, the fact checkers have a much, 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 much smaller budget than that, right? <laughs> and they're also kind of dry, kind of boring, very wonky, lots of numbers, makes you feel like you have to be an expert to be able to parse all of this stuff. I pay the nation fact checkers in pizza. <laughs> really good pizza, though. So. Billion dollar that. pizza. Billion, yeah. And so if you're one of the plutocrats that is bankrolling this election, the return on your investment to bankroll these lies is huge. You have no incentive to adhere to the truth. So I don't, I don't want to leave it on a totally dismal note because I think there are ways to break through, right? There's a great new site that Richard and I were just talking about on the walk over here called actually.org. Well, what do they do that's different? They use humor and they use videos that you kind of want to watch because they're funny. Some of them have movie stars, but they're putting the facts out in a way that's really digestible, really short form, really spreadable. Right? I sent a video on actually.org today to about 100 friends with a click of a button. These are the kinds of innovations that are going to help to level the playing field. But as long as you can, as long as the plutocrats and, and the, the bankrollers of the election can, can skip over, we're going to be challenged from here on out. And if Romney wins, all bets are off because that will prove that lying pays. So I want to zoom out a little big picture and ask Katrina and Pat, um, who I know have thought very deeply and historically about elections and this election. What is at stake <laughs> in this election for, for progressives, for our democracy, for our country? And what is not at stake? Huh, that's a good. So Katrina and then Pat. Thank you, Richard. Um, you know, I began my morning at, uh, on Roosevelt Island at the Four Freedoms Memorial Park, now New York State's 214th State Park. And I bring that up because there was a lot of talk, not only about the Four Freedoms, freedom from fear, freedom from want, but the role of an activist government in pursuit of the common good, an act of, of social justice. And I think that part of what we're seeing at stake in this election is the dismantling, the repeal, of the civilizing advances of the 20th century. And I'm thinking here of voting rights, of women's rights, of the social contract, of Medicare, of Medicaid, of social security. And I think that is at stake. And they have made very clear that they want to gut this. We've seen in the way they've campaigned. But I also think what's important to remember, and I would quibble a little with my great colleague, John Nichols, the debates I'm not sure the debate commission is the most corrupt commission in the United States or the totalitarian <laughs> world, but okay, I, I... The Supreme Court. I don't, but that, I'm, com I'm coming to that. Uh, but I, I do think that movements, uh, the movements of our time, and this time last year, I don't know if some of you were here, but Richard Kim moderated a gathering to talk about Occupy Wall Street. But I do think Occupy has pushed some questions that might not otherwise be in this campaign and in this debate. Action needs to be taken. So I, I think what is at stake also, and Elise wrote about this in an issue we did just a week or so ago, why Obama, as did Deepak Bhargava, what's at stake is the space that progressives need in which to organize. Think of the advances made in this last year on LGBT rights, on immigrant rights. You need the space in which to organize, and with a Romney administration and, God help us, a full sweep of a Republican Congress, that space is closed down. Yes, you can go work in the states, but you need to have some victories to, to fight for. The other thing I'd argue is if we've already lost if we accept a 40, and I dated 40 because I'm obsessed with this Lewis Powell memo, which you probably check it out, but 40-year right-wing assault on our political imaginations, which has crippled our imaginations in some ways because we've been in a defensive crouch. So I think we need to make sure that we come out of this election with, you know, if we, if, if we lose, we still need to 
lay out a compelling alternative to market fundamentalism and to austerity. We need to fight for good jobs. We need to fight for a different country. We need a de democracy recovery program, which would not simply make sure we are a poor country of two mainstream parties, but have universal registration all of you know, and the Electoral College. I would end with the um, Supreme Court. I don't think that progressives have taken the court and the courts as seriously as the right has in the last 40 years. And, and we neither are seeing, has Obama, in fact. And I was going to say yeah. one thing that we, we need to push Obama on is a full court press, not just on the Supreme Court, but on the lower court appointments and nominating people and fighting for them and working with senators to fight for good people. But this is not just a court that could decide Roe v. Wade. And the next president could shape this court, and Pat is, knows far more about this than I do, not just for four years, but for 40 years. Four justices are over the age of 70. And it is on the social issues, but it's also become a 1% court. It has impeded women's access, for example, in the Walmart Discrimination Act. It has tried to gut the ability of organized labor to organize. It has shielded financial institutions from accountability. And of course, it has made corporations its very best friend in a decision that is, we are witnessing as you listen to John, Chris, Richard, and Elise describe the money polluting our already polluted political system. So I think the court is at stake in a very serious way and that we should not lose the political intensity gap race. Uh, so, you know, those, those are my thoughts, if I could, yeah. Um, the one last thing I would say is um, I do think we are going to be in a, in a big fight coming right out of the election, and it relates to this austerity, mm. because that will demand of us to, to lay out a compelling alternative to um, an austerity light and to point to what's happening in Europe. And I thought Mitt Romney, if he, I have to hear one more time, and Chris on his show a few months ago did it so brilliantly, just dissected this idea that we're, we are all gonna become Greece mm -hmm. if we head down the road of more spending and deficits and debt. Because the greatest crisis of our time, the existential crisis, is the climate crisis, and I would argue joblessness. And it is jobs that need to be at the top of the, atten of the attention of this the political elite. And if not, we're gonna have a new normal, which is very scary, a new normal of nine, Eight percent, which is not what you, you, is you saw. Make Martha Raddatz, the the moderator of the vice presidential debate, say, mm -hmm. as a preamble, Social Security and Medicare are going broke. What would you do about I it? Know. And neither candidate bothered to to to, to correct that exactly. framework. Pat, the court to you. I mean, you've studied the courts. Do you share Katrina's view that this is an absolutely urgent election in, in terms of absolutely. that? Absolutely, I think the courts are absolutely the most important. Thing. Power that the president, what what this election will determine is the entire um, composition of the court, of the federal court, of the um, uh, of the lower benches as well as the Supreme Court, um, and that's quite urgent. Uh, and I don't think that Obama has pressed as hard as he might. On the other hand, I also think that he's in a fairly intractable mm -hmm. position with regard to the resistance that has been uh, yeah. thrown up. And it isn't just against Obama. Uh, uh, Clinton faced the same thing. Our um, our judiciary, our federal judiciary, has um, uh, is, is tremendously overtaxed because of the vacancies um, and because of the resistances to even the most moderate candidates um, who come up. And the time that it has taken to uh, review these candidates has doubled, quadrupled um, in, uh, in, in years precisely because of partisan bickering at the approval level. Um, it is really, really important, and I'm not certain what can be done given the pre current uh, composition of the court um, with regard to some of the cases coming up right now, regardless of the election. But certainly if Ginsburg retires, um, as um, she may because her health is quite fragile, um, um, it, this election will, de will determine uh, 40 years, not just the temporal landscape, um, but a, a jurisprudential landscape that is, mm -hmm. you know, that. that you know, you can see pretty clearly where we're going with something like like Citizens United. Uh, you also have um, uh, Roberts, and many people took a little heart. I was surprised to see um, by Roberts uh, 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 um, upholding the Affordable Care Act to a certain degree, without actually taking into account that he. Um, did not find that an insurance system of this sort um, is, uh, is, is, is a matter for the Commerce Clause. Yeah. And, um, well, it was dictum um, in that particular case. Um, 
it is um, very much likely to be the centerpiece <laughs> of future decisions. And uh, if the insurance system is not uh, squarely within the Commerce Clause, then no part of the civil rights movement is. Mm. Um, then what you really mm. have in that case, uh, to me, is the unexploded grenade um, in that case. Those particular words um, made my heart chill um, because this is going to be the centerpiece of a whole uh, category of jurisprudence that's Ayn Rand in the extreme and that will undo the entire civil rights movement and it will go back to something before the Lochner era. Um, this, this, you know, the, uh, some part of me also, I mean, you know, aside from the courts, what's at stake is an entire system almost as two, you know, it's not just two ideologies, it seems to me, in this, um, in this campaign. It's also two different epistemologies, two different teleologies, two different faith systems, mm -hmm. um, or at least a faith system against a system of empiricism. And it's almost like the debates, the fault that I have the debate with the debates is that they have become, I mean, it's, it's like we use the word, I don't know, it's, it's a de degradation of the word debate. Um, it's sort of like we use the word donation of blood and body parts when in fact it's a market and it makes it sound, it's, it's, it's sort of euphemistic. This isn't a debate, it's a theater, it's a ritual. Um, and that's why I think so many people are paying so much attention to the, you know, again, the tilt of the head, right. the intonation, why Romney was so clearly coached to look exactly like Romney, uh, uh, R Ronald Reagan. Even his hair got cut mm -hmm. a little bit more like Ronald Reagan. The visuals of this are quite particular. Um, um, Romney's accent is much more Southern. I mean, people are talking about uh, uh, Obama sounding a little bit more black in one country. Nobody's really listening. Obama, I, I, Romney was a classmate of mine. He, we were in the same law school class. People even forget he was a lawyer. Um, but he was in my law school class. He didn't sound quite as Southern as he does these days. And it seems to me even <laughs> that, th 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 the appeal funny. is at that level. And so if you have these rituals of... Um, um, of, of, of how the priest acts, <laughs> um, and we're judging at that surface level of whether or not um, uh, you performed the ritual, and it is all performative, um, then it doesn't matter to really look deeply and take and, and, and you know to, to take into account um, what's being said. I you know when Chris said that it was interesting to have it in New York, I would love to love love to have these debates take place in Massachusetts because every time he claims that I pushed the educational system of Massachusetts to be number one, <laughs> Massachusetts has always been number yeah. one or close <laughs> to it. I mean it has the first public school education system in the country. I mean it's 400 years worth of practice, um, and the only reason the rest of the country isn't taking the lessons of Massachusetts is that because Texas seems to be dragging it in the other direction. Um, but Massachusetts is number one because it has defined curricula yeah. that have worked over generations that have been tested. If it is a laboratory of what's supposed to happen in the rest of the nation, I would like to ask Governor Romney why we aren't exporting that. Similarly, uh, you know, it, it is, is well unionized. Um, it is. It has more educated people per capita, and those people are paid well to be in the education system, and uh, and and so it's it's if it's an example, um, why aren't we using it as the exemplar for the national uh, 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 for the national conversation? Similarly with health care, I cringed every time Obama said, "I'm proud that it is Obamacare." It's Romney Care. Let's call it what it was. <laughs> it's Romney Care, and if it is again, if the states are labs then uh, you know, I know that there's a little bit, you know, maybe it's different in the federal, uh, you know, to exp export it to the federal system, but it is absolutely vital, it seems to me that if it, this is the theater of performance, that Obama keep calling it Romney care as much as Obamacare, um, that if we're gonna be bipartisan about anything, let's do that. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll, I know uh, uh, Katrina and Chris wanted to jump mm -hmm. in, so, yeah. Katrina? No. No. no? Chris? I just want to say one quick thing, which is when I think about the stakes of the election, the thing I, I keep coming back to, um, aside from, you know, the millions of people who are going to be get Medicaid or not get Medicaid, um, which is in some ways the most concrete. It's very hard for me to see, although with the Senate and Democratic hands, maybe the Affordable Care Act subsidies survive and the Affordable Care Act survives. But the assault, if Romney's president, is going to be sustained and vicious right off the bat. And people are going to start throwing folks on Medicaid. The people that are going to get thrown on the sacrificial altar first 
are the poor. That that's that is going to be the bargaining chip. It's much easier to start trading away Medicaid stuff than it is Medicare and Social Security. The the entitlements, the social insurance for the the middle class and seniors is much more politically difficult to go after. But the Medicaid stuff and the subsidies, which are the two things, the linchpin of getting those 30 million people into the system, 15 million of those are Medicaid, 15 million of those are subsidized. That's going to go first. But aside from that, the the one thing I'll say is. The reputation of liberal governance is on the table. More than anything, if Barack Obama loses, this is, we tried to do liberal governance and it was a massive epochal failure. Let's never do that again. I absolutely, you can see the writing on the wall, particularly if you look at consumer confidence data, you look at household deleveraging, which has proceeded quite a pace, you look at housing starts, and you start to see the contours of a genuine, sustained, robust economic recovery. If there is a genuine, sustained, robust economic recovery that comes on the heels of the election of Mitt Romney, this will be a historical declaration of the failure of the Recovery Act, of the failure of national social insurance in, in the Affordable Care Act, of the failure of everything that the center left and the Democratic Party and liberal governance stands for as having killed the economy, as having cost jobs, as having stood in the way of, the, of, 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 the, of America becoming itself in full entrepreneurial flourish, and that a recovery under Romney will be seen by the elites, by the chattering classes, and by historians, I think, who are gonna fight this battle about the legacy of this, this period of time as a final kind of rendering of history's judgment on the project of liberal governance, and it will be extremely, extremely difficult politically to recover for that from, for a generation. That's when I moved to Canada. Um, That's dark. Yeah. So here's a, here's, here's a tough question. And it's going to go to John and Katrina. We're, we're, we're on the, you guys are all on the same mast that I'm on. And this issue, we have an editorial called Reelect the President. In that editorial, the editors wrote, there is no denying this president's spinal collapse when it comes to defending core civil liberties. Obama promised to close Guantanamo, then reversed himself. He did not end military tribunals and restored the rule of law for terror suspects. He launched a drone war that is killing civilians and fueling a backlash against the United States throughout the Muslim world. And he has not rolled back the imperial presidency of George W. Bush as he promised. Indeed, in some instances, more power has been concentrated in the White House by a president who now reserves the right to extrajudicially assassinate U.S. citizens. All right. You point to me first. Why? why, why? I mean, I, you know, I think a lot of progressives out there share this view and come to a different conclusion about whether or not they should vote for Obama. What, what do you say to them, John? Not that many have come to a different conclusion. Yeah. Uh, okay. The reality uh, is uh, that progressives are very realistic voters, stunningly realistic voters, uh, perhaps too realistic uh, for a very, very long time. And I think this election has some of the parameters, not all of them, obviously, because of circumstance of the 1964 election, uh, which, if you look back historically, was the election in which third parties were, had the least impact uh, because people actually thought, wow, Lyndon Johnson, a southerner, kind of a thuggish guy who we really don't like very much and who's got some bad behaviors and uh, you know, was part of a Senate that didn't do very much on civil rights and stuff like that, and we desperately need to reelect him or keep him in office because Barry Goldwater scares the wits out of us. Mm. So I, I think that, that circumstance creates some realities. Let me, let me just suggest here that uh, I was not that big a Barack Obama enthusiast in 2008. I had covered him since 1996 in Illinois. And I had seen him in many, many different circumstances. I had interviewed him and I was not that excited by him as a candidate. Uh, and, and so I haven't been that disappointed by him as a president. Uh, in fact, he's turned out to be surprisingly similar to what I expected. This is a guy who in February of 2008 went to the GM plant, famous now GM plant in Janesville, Wisconsin, and, uh, and said, we're gonna, fight to, we're gonna fight free trade. We're gonna do a great, you know, we're gonna be with the workers. Um, he then in June, once he had secured the nomination, did an interview, I believe, with Fortune, in which he said, you know, you say things on the campaign trail in a primary that, you know, are a little extreme, but I just want my business friends to know that I'm not going to fight that hard for fair trade. And so he's been pretty much what I expected him to be. And, um, and so what I look at in an election is always 
uh, the, the possibilities of what that election could mean. I loved the movement that elected Barack Obama more than I did Barack Obama. I'm sorry that the movement was demobilized. And, and so as I look at this election, here's what I, I think is, is real. There are multiple possibilities for what can happen. The number one possibility is that Barack Obama is reelected in a sweeping mandate election. And you think, oh, well, that it can't happen. That could actually, that could very much happen. You could actually have uh, four or five of the swing states go his way. If you just follow the polling, Arizona flip, Nevada flip, Colorado go. Uh, I'm just going to read your polls from now what? on, John. I'm, just, I'm <laughs> no, only no, no. subscribing is, to this RSS these feed. <laughs> are, these are, if you go to Real Clear Politics today, you yeah. will see polling that shows that possibility is very, very real. It would not be a popular vote one, but it would be an Electoral College very significant win. And through dumb luck, you get significant advances in the Senate uh, that, you know, Heidi Heitkamp, Tammy Baldwin, Elizabeth Warren, Maisie Hirano, why are these all women? That's a very encouraging thing. Uh, all win, and you have Carmona win in Arizona, and suddenly something real is happening there. And then in the House, uh, part of that swing, you actually, things go, so that's what you get. That's your, that's a scenario. The other scenario on the other end is the whole damn thing going Tea Party, right? That you really do have, uh, and that is also possible. And then the most likely result, which is we end up right in the middle with Barack Obama and a Republican Congress, and we have just spent not six million, I find your, your romanticism very lovely, but 10 to 11 billion dollars um, <laughs> to get exactly where we started. And, and so I think these are all possibilities. In that context, what I would say to progressives is, use your conscience, vote for the best possible result in that context, the best thing you can get. And, and I'm not gonna ever tell somebody not to, you know, it's not my job to tell you who to vote for, but I would say that for me, it's not that hard to figure out mm -hmm. because I want the, the left wing of the possible, as Michael Harrington said, and then a little bit more. And so I'm gonna vote as best I can to get there. And if uh, we stumble along the way, as we often do, so be it, but I'm sure as heck having come from Wisconsin, right? Where people said the 2010 election maybe didn't matter that much. You know, Scott Walker seemed like a kind of okay guy. Um, and we lost in 2010 Russ Feingold, and we ended up with complete Republican dominance of our state legislature and our governorship. And within two months, they had taken away our tort rights. They had cut taxes massively for corporations, and then they turned around and took away the collective bargaining rights of organized labor. And so with all due respect, I don't want that happening in America. Yeah, I think, I think the states are really compelling look at what a Tea Party governor would look like federally. Katrina, I, mean, I know you Rich, want to. Richard, I would just, you know, the, the editorial, and I will say here, I regret that it, we, it ended up being titled Re-elect the President, um, because I don't know. It, we can discuss how that happened, but uh, I think it was it, my it's fault. A far yeah, more, yeah. <laughs> what, what was up with that? It's a far more nuanced editorial. Shade. It's a far more no, nuanced editorial, but um, it is, um, and it's really the idea is that listen, electoral victory is vital. Obama's win, Sherrod Brown, Elizabeth Warren, but it's not sufficient to rebuild a strong progressive politics. But to the question of the kind of foreign policy, national security policy we've seen. I see William Hartung here who knows far more about this than I do. And I think of last night, the politics, the politics of the national security debate, which we will be forced to watch more of on October 22nd, are so troubling, horrifying, horrifying wrong. And you saw that in some way just politically last night. I mean, not only did Romney lie about Obama saying it was not a terrorist attack, but then he went on about Obama's apology tour. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that's just this meme which is full of lies. But you know, uh, what, we're, what we've witnessed, and just let me stand back for a moment, is that this country is still at war. And at times of war, and Pat knows more about this than I do, this country has jettisoned civil liberties very quickly. During World War II, during World War I, during Vietnam to a large extent, the Korean War. And until we come out of this global war on terror, which the president doesn't speak of, but is still governing according to that premise, mm. we will 
not sign a treaty on any battlefield, which has not really ever happened in this country's history, and we will be consigned, as Justice Brennan said in an extraordinary speech in Jerusalem in 2006, to live with the erosion of civil liberties, because until we can balance, find a balance that European countries have in dealing with terrorism, with national security crises, we are consigned to this kind of politics. Now, someone mentioned LBJ. LBJ was not the first African-American president. LBJ, in conversations we now know with Dick Russell, Senator Russell, was fearful of being called soft on communism, even though he knew we needed to get out of Vietnam. We are still living with being soft, soft on terrorism. And President Obama is operating in an environment where I think Chris and I heard this, he should have shut down Guantanamo day one. He did not anticipate the political blowback, nor did he, nor did he then expand and expand the political capital he could have. The drone war, you know, we gotta fight it. I will end by saying there was a peace and justice movement in this country. On, in 1982, again, uh, during the Cold War, which by the way, I don't think is over, but in 1982, there were a million people walking in Central Park in this good city to call for nuclear reductions. We still need those. We need a sane nuclear nonproliferation policy, and we need a foreign policy and a national security policy that is not hyper-militarized, which to some extent both candidates are buying into because that will not deal with the great challenges of our time, whether it's climate crisis, global joblessness, nuclear proliferation, epidemics. I could go on, but the editorial in the end we stand by, and I think it does speak to what John suggested, that you have to both speak up and speak out, but you do so from an understanding that this is a president who can be moved, can be moved, and again, what's at stake, Mitt Romney's policy appears to be one of wanting to go to war quite quickly with Iran if he had the opportunity, and to bring back a set of third-rate, fourth-rate, fifth-rate neocons who would take us back to the truly failed policies of a different period, and I end, we're ending a war in Iraq, I don't think it's fully ended, we're ending a war in Afghanistan, which should be ended more quickly. And we should find ways, as our correspondent Jeremy Scahill has written, to find ways to extricate those, those uh, Blackwater private mm -hmm. contractor forces. And end, I'd like to hear this on October 22nd. Why do we have 800 bases ringing this world when we're closing libraries, schools, and universities and find a way to bring that money back into our country? Pat, did you, yeah? Yeah, yeah I, I, you know, for me the question isn't really, you know, who am I going to, I don't see this election as just about one individual is against the individual, it's who I want to be in charge of the USA Patriot Act, because I think that that's also a big elephant in the room. It's very hard to read. I mean, the USA Patriot Act is, you know, what I teach my students, we have the Constitution, and on the other hand, we have this utterly unreadable, endless document that revokes almost everything um, that has to do with security, I mean, uh, uh, you know, privacy um, in the name of security, um, surveillance, um, extraordinary powers of rendition, of, 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 of control of the monetary system in particular. Um, and nobody reads, nobody has read it, it's just really very hard because the entire uh, uh, piece of legislation is amendments to other acts, and it goes on for 800 pages like that. Um, but it is the counter-constitution. Um, so when I think of who's going to be the president, the executive is also an executive of that piece of legislation, and it's terrifying. Mm. Um, the second thing that I'm concerned about um, is that Romney really is a libertarian in the Ayn Rand sense. Paul Ryan gets all the credit for that. Um, but if, again, looking at what he's done in Massachusetts, um, he is effectively the same kind of libertarian. Um, he believes in the military, he believes in the police power, and he doesn't believe in much else. And he keeps touting himself, I know how to get things done. As a businessman, he knows nothing, apparently, about the law, law degree notwithstanding. And it came out most forcefully, I thought, either as hypocrisy or ignorance, one take your pick, um, last night when he talked about um, women. And, uh, you know, the, the big binder full of names that he was going to get. Um, 
And basically what he did was he endorsed affirmative action as it actually operates in the world. Um, he endorsed affirmative action as it is up mm. for de de determination before the Supreme Court right now, which is that, you know, well, you know, we don't have any women here. Let's find some names and let's put them right. before. That's what affirmative action yeah. is. That is a really, that is really a, great point. <laughs> yeah, no, it is exactly what's, what's at stake in the action. Fisher v. Texas case. And he basically bought into it, but he doesn't seem to know that that's what affirmative action is because it's become so compressed into the lie that affirmative action is choosing people who have no qualifications. And when you say go out and get some women with qualifications, you know, it's, you know, we, there's a, there's a way in which the right wing has pitted women and minorities against each other in the discussion of affirmative action. If you notice Grutter, all of the affirmative action yes. cases in the last well, 10 well, years well, were well, really well, part well. Of, a, of a campaign to put women up because if you had a white man, it wouldn't be the same. But these are women. And so, but, but in fact, the jurisprudence is the same. So if this gets struck down, we can't have women either. And, a, and, and, in, and in Massachusetts, Romney it, um, it abolished uh, the Office of Affirmative Action for the state of Massachusetts. Um, he did exactly the opposite of the women that he got the binder for were from a women's activist group in response to his... Ask, he didn't actually... Yeah. Yeah. He was given yes. it. Yeah. They were pushed it on him. Um, but his embrace of this now um, is either the most peculiar kind of, um, you know, <laughs> contradiction, or it is ignorance, one or the other. Um, I'd much rather have what keeps being referred to as derisively as, as the professor in this. Now, at the same time, when John talks about um, not being surprised, I too was not surprised by Obama's uh, co course. And I do think that this expect expectation that he was going to be Jesus Christ and Ma Malcolm X and, uh, you know, Muslim and, uh, you know, the, 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 the the progressive, you know, a and a socialist. Yeah. I mean, he was, there were so many Much wild yeah. expectations, projections onto him, it, it, that even in this election, I'm very concerned that again, this, this sense of emotional truth of about each candidate um, really obscures the fact that he was always a center candidate. He yeah. was head of Harvard Law Review, which has never been ever mm -hmm. called a radical organization. Um, he was a Ch University of Chicago law professor teaching very conservatively. Um, and that all got obscured, I think, and you know, and it, 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 we seem to have embraced emotional truth as our, as our, as our guiding star in all of this. And you know, my sense of emotional truth. Remember when James Frey used that term, and you know, and Oprah said, "That's a lie." Mm -hmm. And in fact, we are lying to ourselves if, in fact, you know, the, you know, that 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 our relation to this man um, is based entirely on his symbolic value or it's in based entirely upon our projections and our best wishes, even when they're idealistic, um, to the exclusion um, of the nuts and bolts empirical facts of what each of these um, candidates represents. I, I, I just also can't yeah. believe that Harvard produced Romney, Obama, and Pat Williams. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, it was a step ladder One thing up. turned out really well it there was a in ladder that education. Upward. Yeah. Can I just add a brief historical yeah, sure, note, too, that onto your, your wonderful affirmative action analogy mm -hmm. here, uh, that the one thing that, that I wish Barack Obama had said was, you know what's funny about you know, doing this women in the governor's office there, didn't you push aside the woman who was governor and say, you can't run for re-election, we're going to cut your money off, woman mm -hmm. and working mom, mm -hmm. so that I could run? Mm -hmm. So didn't you, as the white guy, come and shove the woman out of the way to become governor of Massachusetts? And it's one of the things that I, you know, people always say the uh, moderate, you know, like Candy Crowley was too, you know, invasive or whatever in last night's debate. I would pay money to have points like that made in debates because I want to see these guys squirm and have to answer questions okay. like that. And the fact of the matter is they don't squirm very much. Even last night, the only squirming was when, you know, Mitt Romney found out that that right-wing blogs aren't the only right. place that you get information from. Right. At least I want to ask you. Oh, good, because I was going to do yeah. Romney and I, I, go ahead. I know you've been traveling around the country. I have. Um, and, you know, John mentioned the sort of demobilization of the Katrina. Also, I think the demobilization of the base um, that Obama assembled in, in 2008. Are you seeing that? You know, how excited are people if, if presidents are also movements that we elect in a way. Um, 
what what kind of constituency are we empowering um, if Obama wins? It's an interesting question. It's actually the one I was going to go back to because um, I know my my friend John Nichols and I don't too much agree uh, disagree on this, but the the choice of language is one I object to because the base was not demobilized. That is as though we don't have our own agency, right? The base chose to say, oh, we elected you, we can just follow your lead now and everything will be fine. And that fit squarely within the administration's plans. We were having this conversation backstage. But the reality is they hold nothing over us once they're in power, right? The, the idea that any administration, much less this one, is not going to fight for health care if the base gets out of line and says, we want a public option, or God forbid, single payer. we want single payer, is just complete psychosis. Now, they want you to believe that sometimes because they don't want more trouble. They live in a heap of trouble every day. They want one last thing to deal with. But the base made a choice at that time to follow in step. And I think that is what we will see differently this time around. I think there will be an enormous amount of relief if Obama is reelected, but I don't think you're going to see people just saying, okay, my job here is done. Because the reality is in many, 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 many ways, we have moved backwards in the last four years on things the base cares about. And I actually hate the term the base. American people actually hold an enormous amount of values in common. That is what I've learned as I've traveled all over this country. American people want the same things. And when we actually get down to that level of talking about it, I want, I, I don't want earthquakes in my hometown from fracking. Oh my God, that is not a revolutionary idea, right? Um, but we're not having these conversations at the presidential level. Now, I will tell you, a lot of these conversations are actually happening, happening at the level of house races State house races, absolutely. These conversations are happening. So social movements are well and alive and in some ways even more invigorated. And the idea that um, people can't hold both, can't say, okay, look, we need to keep Obama in office because we need some things that we don't need to worry about. And because we, you know, there are people who will suffer day one and a Romney presidency at the same time as, and I have power and I have levers of power that I can utilize, especially once you get away from this obsession we have with the presidential race, right? Mm -hmm. Which for very important reasons, as Pat and Katrina have outlined, executive powers and Supreme Court, really, really critically important. But once you get away from the obsession we have with the presidential race, we're seeing the money, the money that we talk about, down ballot, devastating, right? Arkansas, and I'm from the South. Um, I, in fact, John just doodled a little foot stomping on my home state of Texas in my book to, to make me mad. Um, but I'm from the South. Arkansas has had a Democratic state house for years and years and years. Now, is that different than a New York, New York Democratic state house? It is. But it is still something that is probably going to change this cycle, and it's Koch brother money. Yeah. And people are seeing that and feeling it. And this presents a huge opportunity, and, and this is how I'll close. But one of the things that I'm seeing as I travel around is this real need to redefine who we are as progressives mm -hmm. from a values place, from a story place, not attached to any one leader. And that's going to happen at the local and state level. That's why we're seeing offensive movement, public funding at New York State. You see people fighting for that, right? You're seeing all sorts of um, ideas crop up about, we're not going to move legislation, not real legislation in the next two to four years federally. It's not going to happen regardless of the outcome of the election. At the state level, not only can we make real progress, on economic issues, on environmental issues, but as we do it, we can start to tell a different story about who the progressive base is, and I see people really, really excited about so that. So I want to ask I, you. I, I want to just to build Go very ahead. briefly on that because I couldn't agree more with Elise, and I think there's already motion and movement, even before this election takes place, among, for example, in this good city, Brad Lander, who's in the New York City Council, has joined forces with city council people across this country to start this municipal elected officials group, which is gonna try to do 
good legislation at the state level, whether it's sick pay days or living wage or minimum wage increases or environmental legislation. And I think you'll see that in, in uh, the Progressive Caucus, you need to strengthen inside the House. Keith Ellison is a good co-chair because we can't just talk about the presidential. We are witnessing three, four elections this cycle, presidential, Senate, House, State House. And as Elise says, it's gridlock inside the Beltway, so we need to build outside and deepen the bench. Deepen the bench, there's a group called Progressive Majority working with others, trying to run 1,000 candidates. These are not just people from the elite of the Democratic Party, because I do think what's up for redefinition after this election is not only liberal governance, as Chris mentioned, but the Republican Party may go through an extraordinary soul searching, which, I mean, I'm not feeling for their soul much, but they are <laughs> gonna go through soul searching. And I think the Democratic Party will as well. And what is the Democratic Party? And I think of Paul Wellstone. We're on the 10th anniversary of his death mm -hmm. this month. And he was a conviction politician, someone who understood poverty was the shame and crisis of our nation, and someone who understood that you work with movements and organizers, not just at election time, not just as election ground troops, but as an ongoing process. And we need to rebuild those links between the electeds and those on the outside, because as Francis Piven said, we make a mistake when we pit the two against each other. You need both, and we're going to need them at all levels moving forward. So here, here's a bunch of questions that are on a similar theme from the, from the audience. Uh, so let me, let me try and you know, phrase these sort of together. Um, Elise, you, know, you talked about movements sort of pushing the, the, the president. Um, we saw during the healthcare debate, though, for example, progressives did want you know, public option out there, and that was absolutely sort of shut down by, by, by the political apparatus there. Right? Chris, you were in Washington, maybe you, know, you could sort of comment on that. On the other hand, we have seen the gay and lesbian movement, for example, be very successful in, in really agitating against this president and achieving right, uh, mm -hmm. some measure of, of, of victory. The same thing with the DREAM. Mm -hmm. Act and the and and also the Keystone Pipeline. You know when Bill McKibben and activists surrounded the White House, that that made a difference in their decision. So questions here: you know, What should progressives do after the election on November seventh? What movements, right? We're gonna are gonna be activated around this. What should we sort of target as the most important thing? So I'll tell you, as someone who was in the th I was at Move On during the healthcare fight, and and as someone who was in the thick of it. Um, it the thing that we did wrong in the healthcare fight, and this was actually mainstream progressives, this was centrist progressives, was the same thing that the, it was the same flawed theory that the administration plays by. We, if I could go back, I would push resources towards single payer groups. Because what we did was make the public option this crazy left idea, which it wasn't. It was an incredibly centrist idea. Now, if you look at the trajectory of those issues and how they played out right after the election, energy came first, right? No better finance movement. In fact, the, the Enviros will admit to have spent, spent $200 million on the climate change energy bill. Um, I think it was probably closer to three or $400 million. What'd they get? They got two guys on stage last night who did, spent 10 minutes on energy talking about who was gonna drill more and didn't utter the words climate change, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Healthcare fight came along. We did, we, we said, and what the Enviros didn't do, they got in lockstep from before the, the, the bill dropped mm -hmm. and it gave away stuff to coal and the Enviros said, don't talk about that because we need this bill to pass and we're gonna get cap and trade if we all stay together, right? Got nothing. Mm -hmm. So we said, okay, we're gonna carve out the public option as it, that, that was part of Obama's plan, but we're gonna really push for that because we know that we need this one thing. We had no, we had nothing further from the spectrum. So we, Obama, who constantly wants to move to the center, we just made the center more to the right for him, right? Mm. So this is the dynamic that we are facing as a movement, is that when we wanna get behind our leader, on the things that he said he's going to do during the primary <laughs> and sometimes until the in the magazine. right until the fortune magazine we actually let's be benevolent here we do him a disservice that's right we do him a disservice so 
We cannot make that mistake again. And you know what? Maybe I believe in single payer. I mean, maybe I believe in, in public option. And, and many of our members genuinely believed in public option. We've got to educate our members that unless you've got the single payer folks out there screaming their hearts out and chaining themselves to the White House, like a lot of the LGBT activists and Lieutenant Dan Cho did, then your hope of, single, uh, of public option is going to go poof and evaporate into there. November 7th? I mean, we better not wait, mm -hmm. but November 7th, we better start screaming as loud as we can that it's about jobs, mm -hmm. not austerity, and that Social Security, Medicare, not broke, not bankrupt, total lie, right? Total lie. And we've got to do that with every single issue. And we've got to actually recognize that the people that don't agree with us because we think they're more radical than us, they're actually our best friends. And the more platform we give them and the more space we give them, or us, depending on where you are, um, the more progress progressives are gonna make. So Chris, to you, you were in Washington for a lot of these fights and you're a student of the Beltway. Where, what are the most important things coming up? And also, where, where do we have some leverage? Where are the openings, perhaps? The biggest opening, in, in a world in which Barack Obama is reelected and he wins, <laughs> Um, Nevada, and even if he doesn't win Florida, um, and Arizona is close, and Mitt Romney performs at the level that John McCain did among Latinos, um, th there is a real problem for the Republican Party. Obviously, everyone knows this. This is not some novel observation that the country is becoming less white as the Republican Party <laughs> continues to be um, <laughs> dominated by white voters. Um, and so they are worried about this, the smart ones are. And the only, and I actually don't think there'll be any soul searching in the party. I think actually there'll be, I, I don't see any incentives for it except on this one issue. Amongst the Republicans. Yeah, yeah. I think if, even if the Republicans. Because their souls are in horcruxes, they're sort of split up into seven little no, shards. No, I just, I actually think. No, I actually think, I just think, the, I just think the activists, I think a big part of it is the activists on the right have done a really good job of what Elise just said. Right. They just, they, they don't, like, they've primaried the heck out of every, everyone. Mm -hmm. And they'll just come and cut your head off. They don't, they don't care. They boo their Like, who are you, Ro Bob Bennett? Yeah. You're a senator from Utah who voted, <laughs> get the hell out of here. I don't want you. And you, some establishment, Richard Luger, who, you know, <laughs> makes nice on nuclear non -proliferation. Get out of here. I don't want you. Like, they've just been really badass about just being lethal to anyone who is not with them on everything. And so I don't think there'll be much soul searching. The one place that I do see a real opportunity is, is on immigration, partly because business interests in this country want comprehensive immigration reform. And generally, if you're betting on politics, in Washington, you should just go to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce website <laughs> and figure out what their priorities are, and those are a good place to place your bets. And, and, and the business interests in the country do want a comprehensive deal, and so I think you can, so there's going to be, I think, a possibility of, a, of some sort of deal on that. And there, I think, it's the exact same thing, because you can imagine a really horrible bankrupt deal that essentially creates a, a rightless indentured labor force that is tethered to their employee by a single piece of paper which can be withdrawn by said employee, by said employer, um, as opposed to actually bringing the 12 million people that we have who are living in the shadows into the mainstream of American life. So that's the hopeful place. That's the one place where I really do think there's possibility for genuine um, legislative action that would reduce the net amount of suffering in the country would make the country more humane, make the country more equitable. Mm. The place where there is no foreseeable possibility of anything legislative is climate. Mm -hmm. And that you saw last night on stage. Please in, share your quote from last night. Well, I just said, you know, you can't talk, it's like you can't, talking about energy policy and not talking about climate is like talking about smoking and not talking about cancer. I mean, if you were came from Mars and you looked at our policy about cigarettes in this country and you didn't know cigarettes cause cancer, you would be like, why do they have it out for this one industry? What is the deal with this like vendetta, these punitive taxes they keep 
hosting on, you know, these attorney generals suing this one, in like, what is the deal? And so Barack Obama got up there and tried to defend his energy policy without talking about climate. It's a very hard thing to do because the people, Stephen Chu accepts the mm -hmm. climate scientists mm -hmm. and conducts himself accordingly, much to his great credit. Mm -hmm. But of course, you can't articulate why he's doing what he's doing without talking about climate. So it's a very weird argument to try to make. The, the, the last thing I'll say on climate is that I am now a believer that it's just the only place there's that we can get, the, and, and this is not my insight, the climate folks have realized this, and Bill McKibben, 350 people, it's just direct action. You just need to go after coal. Mm -hmm. You need to go after the people in fossil fuels. You need to chain yourself to stuff. Mm -hmm. It just, forget it. Forget the Senate, forget the House. Just forget it. Forget it for whenever, whenever sometime in the future they come to their senses, but things can't wait, and it just needs to be shut down. It just needs to be shut down. You need to, you need to go after the industries that are putting the carbon in the air, and they have to just start to they have to start to worry um, about their viability, and it has to become a problem for them. And then, if it becomes enough of a problem for them, maybe you can start getting people to the table to talk about a legislative solution. I think that, that was sort of the consensus after Copenhagen, where people came in there with so much hope that yeah. a new Obama administration w w w would have a different outcome, and, and were so disappointed, and then changed themselves to factories and, and smokestacks. And let me also say this. If, you, if anyone in this room we're sitting in we're sitting in Chicago and advising and doing debate prep in Williamsburg Virginia where the president was i sincerely believe it would be malpractice for you to give him advice other than the advice he got they are not wrong about the politics of the issue they're not at this moment when southeastern ohio is coal country and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people whose livelihoods are in coal and those are people who are swing voters in Ohio. They're not, it's not crazy. It's not ridiculous or vindictive. The, they are reading public opinion correctly. And you can cite any poll you want to cite about. 60% of people think that global warming is bullshit. It's a, it's a difference between preference and intensity. If you are working in, a coal, in coal, in coal country in southeastern Ohio, then you care about whether coal is going to be there. If you're someone who calls, gets some pollster calling you from Ipsos and you say, yeah, yeah, I worry about global warming, you don't care. You don't care. Mm -hmm. That's the problem, is that there is this asymmetry between the people for whom this is an intensity issue, this is life or death, I will do whatever it takes, and the people who will tell a poster, pollster, I care about this issue. And the only way to solve that asymmetry is for the people on the other side of that ledger to say, this is a life or death issue, I care about it that much. So here's, here's another question from the audience that um, hasn't really come up, at least in this way, in the debates. And, um, Pat, you're an educator, so maybe I'll throw this to you first, but anyone else can jump in. Both parties support neoliberal education reform. Uh, vouchers, charter schools. How can progressives push back on this? Well, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, that's, uh, how can one push back on this? Um, or is, is that a, is that, uh, is that a big problem? I mean, is that, is that the... Oh, you know, I think stupidity yeah. is running rampant. And I, I think that education has been so um, cut and, uh, and, and is so endangered um, that uh, you have a large percentage of the population of the citizenry which is um, undereducated and misinformed. Um, I disagree a little bit. I mean, I agree entirely. In, you know, it was, uh, I, I agree very much with what Chris just said about the... Um, uh, the climate change issue, but I also think that um, there was a slight under-emphasis on the degree to which people simply, if they don't, if it isn't that they don't care, they say they care, but they just also don't know what's yeah. at stake. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so coal companies, uh, whatever else, are, 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 are understating the degree to which this is a non-renewable resource. Um, that the climate itself is non-renewable, that we are at a that we're at a, we're at a tremendous tipping point at which um, the survival of the species and large creatures is at stake right now. Um, and the way in which this is playing out is uh, you know a, a war among first world and third world for the you know as, as the I couldn't believe during the Republican National Convention when Mitt Romney smirked when he talked about the oceans rising mm -hmm. um, because it's not just first world and third world it's also 
Louisiana. It's also Massachusetts Fisheries. <laughs> lower um, Manhattan. The, it's lower Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. It's two blocks from street, here. Becoming Water <laughs> Street again. Becoming Water again. Um, and uh, and it seems to me that the um, that that part of the lukewarm response to this incredible crisis has to do with religious fundamentalism on the one hand, and I think that that's an enormous, a much larger problem than we sometimes take into account. And second of all, I, when I heard Paul Brown saying, you know, all this embryology, climate science and so forth, you know, again, I want to bring it back to education, and I wanted to say, you know, by what affirmative action program did you get into college and become a doctor <laughs> um, and take the place of a more qualified <laughs> Um, climate believer, you know. I mean, it's, <laughs> um, and it, but it does seem to me that you know that it is. It's, it's partly about ignorance. It's partly about cognitive dissonance, um, and it's. But but the cognitive dissonance is enhanced again by these two separate states of mind. These two teleologies, which are held together, which are held in mind at the same time. One is the empirical fact of what's going on in the world, and particularly with our climate, and the ability to say, well, it's just a war over resources that divides people by nation, by race, by poverty, and so forth, rather than this is a human problem facing our species, and it's immediate. Mm -hmm. And, again, the emotional sense that, um, uh, you know, that, that, that we have faith that, you know, to you know, that, that, that things are all going to, that it's going to work out right, fine, right. and that, that we're on a progressive, and I, and I don't mean progressive in this sense, yeah. but a, a, like a Puritan Jeremiah, that things are always going to get better, and, you know, just all on the other side of the hill will be the celestial city, um, and, and, and there'll be redemption um, with, by doing nothing. But nobody's even taking the minimal practical steps. Um, we don't even have to talk about big coal. Do you remember on 911 mm -hmm. when they grounded all the planes for a week, and the temperature went up three or went down three degrees? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, if we could just have like a week, you know, every few months <laughs> of lowering the temperature, it would have a significant climate effect. We don't have to have the entire technology of replacing oil and gas tomorrow, we could do the small things of, you know, of, of, you know, a no smoking day. The same thing we did with smoking, in fact, a no smoking day. You could have, you know, ground all planes day, ground all, um, you know, or no driving day. Um, and it would make a little bit of difference in the, in the, in the, in the most carbon emitting um, economies. I think, I think that was a very profound statement, but I do want to just not lose the question of Ed reform. To, yeah. And John, I know, yeah. Chicago. You yeah. know that, that that was the centerpiece of that of that of, of the strike there, and and Rahm Emanuel, Barack Obama's former chief of staff, was the architect are of that of that children, war. So what are there any children in the audience? <laughs> Good, because you know, of course Rahm Emanuel, who referred to the base as fucking retards. Um, you know this is a horrible man, and uh, <laughs> let's begin with that stand, from that moderate <laughs> statement on him. Um, and but this is the important thing to you know. Your question is such an important one because it goes to this idea of neoliberalism. And when Chris said, I don't think this party is going to go through soul searching, I don't, you know, I'm not sure that, that they're going to really you know, learn anything from this process, I, I'll tell you, I honestly thought he was talking about the Democratic Party. I didn't know <laughs> that he was referring to the Republicans until he mentioned it specifically because to my mind, the Democratic Party is a crisis. An absolute, you want to talk about a climate crisis. Yeah. There's a political crisis, and the Democratic Party has taken into it um, horrible, horrible ideas. And the interesting thing is that when Rahm Emanuel brought basic horrible ideas, you know, kind of the, the things that Hollywood makes movies about, right, like bad schools and stuff like that, the things that our entire media, like, except for Chris's show, um, but our entire broadcast media accepts, you know, the schools are awful and all that stuff. When he brought these basic premises, not of the Republican right, but of the Democratic mm -hmm. Party and its own Secretary of Education, when he brought these out as ideas that he wanted to implement in the third largest city in the United States, we were immediately told by the silliest person to ever run for president, Mitt Romney, uh, that, that he was on the side of the parents in this struggle. Not the union, not Rom, but he's on the side of the parents. Mm -hmm. And then poll after poll after poll 
came that showed the parents were on the side of the teachers and the union. And amazingly enough, what we realize is on the whole of the neoliberal agenda, so much of which the Democratic Party has accepted and fully embraced, the people aren't with them. They don't like it. And it is one of the reasons why the Democratic Party is in the absolute crisis that it, it is in, that, it, that the Democratic Party is having trouble beating Mitt Romney, Paul Ryan, and the Tea Party. Come on. That is a, that's pathetic. The Democratic Party is in trouble doing that for three reasons, right? Number one, money. Of course, we accept money in politics. Number two, a really lame media, right? But number three, the Democratic Party doesn't stand for exciting enough things to trump money and media. It actually compromises so horribly mm -hmm. that it has to be taught on the streets of Chicago how wrong it is. Mm -hmm. And so I'll close off with just the simplest concept here, that we're going to have an election on November 6th. And uh, you know it's like the Woody Allen film, right, where the two women are sitting in the automat, and the one says, the food here is it's horrible. It's, it's, a, it's, it's inedible. And the other woman says, yes, in such small portions. And <laughs> this is the Democratic Party at this point. And so a lot of people in this room are going to vote for the small portions, or for larger portions of that. But what we ought to do, what we ought to do is be furious, furious and angry at the Democratic Party for offering such narrow and unappealing choices and we ought to look at the one guy who's going to get reelected this fall in a state that has a, had, until two years ago, a Republican governor, has a Republican lieutenant governor, has a large Republican presence in its legislature, into a seat that was formerly held by a Republican, and previously in the House, in a seat formerly held by a Republican, socialist Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. And he is winning, not, he is winning in Republican counties, not by preaching neoliberalism, but by preaching a radical alternative to it that says we need Medicare for all, we need to defend Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid without apology, we need to start bringing the troops home from all of these wars, and we need to amend the Constitution of the United States to say that corporations are not people. That's what the Democratic Party should be running on. It would be getting a lot more votes. So, Chris, I know you wanted to weigh in on <laughs> John's excoriation of the Democratic Party. Just, but, John, I will say to no one in contempt for what's happened to the Democratic Party over the last 40 years, but I do think, and we've had many talks about this, come on, it's not just Bernie Sanders. There's Sherrod Brown who oh, wants to limit and break up yeah. banks. Elizabeth Warren is entering a Democratic Party. We can't individualize it, but we can give support to those who, for example, put out a people's budget, which is essentially the nation's budget. It's not mm -hmm. just about defending Medicare Social Security. It's strengthening. And the financial transaction tax, passionate about it. Robin Hood, you know, let's tax the banks and the speculators, bring some of that money back. So there are people. We just need to strengthen those people as we open up our system to more voices, both elected and outside. I think, but I think that the, the, the CTU strike, A, I think the CTU strike is instructive because the CTU was like, I don't care if you're a Democratic mayor. Mm -hmm. right. Like, mm -hmm. don't. Don't mess. Come at me, bro. Yeah. Like, <laughs> let's do this. And and they were right. And and so that's part of it, right? It's like th this is the lesson, right, from the Common Purpose mm -hmm. Table, which was this the the White House, you know, getting together, yep. progressive groups being like, "Don't come at us, bro." Yeah. Yeah. And that was not effective. You know, very quickly, I just want to say that I, I think there's extremely promising developments in education policy, insofar as this paradigm dominated completely unchallenged for about for since basically the No Child Left Behind. Mm -hmm behind act was passed till about now. The national conversation was entirely mm -hmm. dominated by one way of thinking on both parties about mm -hmm. standards, teacher accountability, the teachers unions are terrible, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. And there has been very good pushback. And, 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 and there is a coalescing, growing number of writers and thinkers and people in think tanks and organizers and the teachers unions themselves. and parents of teachers and, and parents of students and students themselves, there is a growing um, movement in opposition. There really is. It feels stronger and stronger. And the CTU strike, I think, was a, was a, a watershed moment for it. But it's, it's only getting stronger. Because the fact of the matter is, this is a classic experiment. We've been running the experiment. We passed No Child Left Behind a decade ago, uh -huh. right? And Rachel, 
great. Let me yeah. let me offer one other positive example. So, absolutely with Chris as movements. Don't don't taste me, bro. Uh, as movements, we've got to challenge the people in power, even if they're Democrats, right? The Tea Party's famous for booing the Republicans. The first thing they didn't have to open their mouths; they just booed the Republicans. But there's a flip side of this, right? Which uh, Katrina and I have discussed an enormous amount, which is as social movements, we are actually experiencing a crisis in credibility with people who aren't already part of our movements because we keep going along mm -hmm. with the Democrats, right? And so part of that is militant action where it's appropriate. But the other part we're seeing now, AFT, American Federation of Teachers, is doing one of the most radical things I've seen, which is they have gone into one of the poorest counties in West Virginia and they've said, you know what? We know we can't teach kids who don't get a good night's sleep because there's holes in their roofs and, and, and they don't have enough food. And so we know that, but we're gonna be vilified anyway. So they've gone into this poor county, they've done public-private partnerships with food providers, with social service providers, with job trainers to get the parents into the schools and get job training. This is what it takes for progressive institutions to rebuild trust with folks who have lost faith because we keep saying, hey, vote with us and the government's gonna take care of you, right? We're progressives, we believe the government should work for people, but you know what, it ain't right now. So until we get out there and put our money where our mouth is, not only does that actually say to people, you can trust me, stick with me for the long haul and we'll get this system working again, but it also creates a better platform to then go to DC and do the advocacy because it's shown, hey, you know what? These kids that you said were dumb and these teachers that you said couldn't teach them, look at how these test scores went up. Look at how bright they are because you know what? We got them food. We got their parents' jobs because poverty is the problem, not education and not teachers. I want to ask, um, we're going to have one, one final question, and then I'll let you guys sort of weigh in with, their, with, their, with your last thoughts. But several people asked this, so I wanted to get this in. Um, women are 52% of voters. But we're a minority. Um, and even if you're in binders, you know. Um, <laughs> so, so why is there a war on women currently brewing? And why aren't Democrats in the government addressing this more aggressively? Are they ignoring it because women traditionally vote Democratic anyways and they know they can't lose those voters? I, I saw a poll right before this last debate that Romney had actually eked ahead of Obama amongst women voters, which is just sort of like political malpractice on the, on the Obama campaign's part to me. But what, what's, what's fueling this, this, this really, really radical uh, you know, war on women's rights and, and what are the Democrats doing or not doing about it? <laughs> I mean, this is not. I don't. I mean, this is not. This is not new. Uh, we've seen in state after state limitations, restrictions on abortion rights. I think it has, in the same way, the debates over the role of government over taxes have become proxies over issues of race and demographics. I think we're seeing the war on women as a proxy in some ways for control of the family, control of institutions that Republicans feel are slipping away. At the same time, as you point out, Richard, it took feminist action, it took social media and younger women, for example, to push back very hard against what we saw with Susan Komen Foundation, attempts to defund Planned Parenthood from that angle, to really push the president to get contraception into the health care plan and to stand up and understand, hey, there may be more women than bishops in this country. Uh -huh. um, but it's going to be a long struggle because it's, we don't have strong allies in the Democratic Party. And as Elise wrote, I think very astutely, after the horror of Todd Akin's comment, which, by the way, we now know Paul Ryan feels the same way. He signed on, co-sponsored the bill with Todd Akin on redefining rape. But as Elise pointed out, all of these kind of horrific statements by Republicans or actions like the transvaginal ultrasound. We fight those, we think we win, but then they've moved the goalposts in uh -huh. the same way our politics are moving to the right and we're operating on that field when we should be pushing back very hard. I, I, I think we need to build a base of, uh, not well, I think we need to build a base of women activists 
to strengthen them, to strengthen the ties across race, across generations, to uh, fight back and to push the Democratic Party hard because it's gonna need pushing on that front, but also to understand that um, you know, the Republicans have, have um, let me step back. I think the, the main thing we can do right now is I do think President Obama last night was smart. And we need to link women's health rights, the control of their bodies, to the economic security of their lives and to be very clear that women's issues are everyone's issues. Mm -hmm. And to fight on that front because everything that the Republicans want to dismantle and the Democrats may not be defending in strong enough terms relates to women. Who is most effective by the privatization of Social Security or the voucherization of Medicare or the block granting of Medicaid? And to drive that home very clearly, in my mind, is the most effective way to speak at this moment and to force the Democratic Party to stand up and speak, speak more boldly. Mm -hmm. I thought a stunning moment in last night's debate was when uh, a citizen asked about assault rifles. Um, oh yeah, that was a which, which that was, was a which was a great which was a great question. A winner, and the, a answer, winner for and Romney. the answer for Mitt Romney was single mothers. Yeah. Guns don't families. kill people. Single moms kill people. No, but it was also, essentially the it also for precipitated Mitt a hilarious free associational five minutes between both candidates, neither of whom wanted to talk about guns exactly. at all. So they were like, uh, yeah, "What do I got? Uh, <laughs> single moms. Single moms." Uh, <laughs> But you know what's, what's bizarre about that? What's bizarre is that if you watch the interview where Paul Ryan uh, actually shut the interview down in Michigan, he didn't want to answer any more questions from the guy, it was a gun question, and he had tried the, the single mom argument. So this is an internal Romney-Ryan campaign response yes, to yes. questions about guns, which is stronger families. This is not free association. It is structural. Yeah. And the incredible thing is, what the best, the guy I'd make the moderator of all debates, the, the Channel 12 uh, reporter from the Flint station in Michigan, uh, who said, so your answer to all this is to cut taxes. And Romney <laughs> blew up, right? Or Ryan blows up, and he was. He says, I'm not going to take any more of these questions. But in fact, that is the answer. And, right. and this is where I think that you know, I, when women's issues, which I don't think are women's no. issues, come up. Where I was deeply troubled last night was that when they started talking about, when Romney says, well, yeah, I got all these women on my staff from the binder. And yeah, I found out a lot of them really like to go home at five o'clock because uh, they want to be To with their make kids. dinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but, but the other thing was but, that they want to go I home. I let them do that. Yeah, and no, but the, the thing is, he says, I, I let them go home because I, I understood that they had some interest in their children. And, um, and I thought to myself, I thought to myself, you know, what century is this guy running in? Because, you know, he was governor of Massachusetts in the 21st century, in 2006. And I know I'm crazy on this one, but I think by 2006 there were actually some guys who wanted to go home and be with their children. And the fact is, I know of very few issues outside of some reproductive health issues, which even there I think there are deep connections, that are not really human being issues. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I really would have liked yeah. my president yeah. to have said at that point, yeah. you know, Mitt, you're just nuts. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, so, so I, we're, have, I have to answer. I mean, at least go ahead. I, and I have a very radical answer on this. Women are 17 percent of our Congress. That ties us with Turkmenistan. This issue does not get resolved Actually, until they improved this in the recent elections. Yeah. Turkmenistan. Yeah. Yeah. So we're behind Turkmenistan. Um, this issue does not get resolved until we elect more women. And I am so tired of having arguments with my progressive male friends about, well, but in this primary, this guy is more progressive on economics than the woman. And, and he's a solid pro-choice vote. And I'm like, when he gets in there and starts crusading against the bullshit that women have to put in on, then I will compare him as the equal to the woman who could have had that, that position herself. Because I am not seeing these progressive men that we are electing to Congress then actually driving an equality agenda once they're in there. We need equality if we're gonna be treated equal. And here is my very tangible piece 
of advice for you. If you care about this issue, do not give money to the DCCC because you know what? They're raising money on the war on women and they're going out and funding anti-choice Democrats yeah. to get elected. You can play in those races or we can get a majority without those right. seats but do not give money to organizations that are gonna raise money on your issue and then spend it to, on yeah. someone who opposes your issue. So just like last night, we're about 10 minutes over. Uh, and I just, I wanna get, you know, final words from Pat and Chris, cause they haven't, they haven't weighed in lately and, and anything, 19 days left. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think there's a consistency, however, in, in, in the responses that you get to the question of women's rights or um, African American rights or immigration rights or all the rest. And it, it, the, the answer that, you know, it depends upon strong families um, comes up in every one of these debates, guns, anything else, because it is an ultra libertarian response. Um, and the, it, it's, the, there is no government, there is no role. And so the only thing that protects you against a nasty, brutish, you know, uh, mm -hmm. right. jungle of, 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 of life is the strong family and your little, her the little herd, the little tribe that you right. create for yourself. And so that is the rational response within that particular system of thought. And it really is helpful in these times to read Ayn Rand's, um, she wrote a book called The Theory of, of an Epistemology of, um, of Objectivism. And it's a small book. Um, don't read the novels, they're a waste of time and they actually get you all caught up in some sort of plot like there is a life for this kind of ideology. But when she puts it down, everything can be explained by simply finding the people and if they're not your real family, you find the people that you can bunker down with. Um, and so the bunkering down is the response to absolutely everything. But that bunkering down is also a denial of the collective um, public resources of the race publica, of the common good that includes the funding of public schools and the funding of public health and the, um, and, and the funding of even the commerce clause that under, that under um, rights um, the entire civil rights movement. All of that is at stake um, in that response um, that will, you know, just get together and the more of you who, who can get together in a household, um, the more money you'll have and therefore you'll be able to buy more guns to protect yourself. I mean, that's what that response is about. I think this is a great place to end it tonight. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, audience, for coming. We'll see you here for our next event. Thanks.